Good morning, everyone. Come on in, settle in. It's 9.15, which means it's time for service and time for some announcements. Welcome, whether you're joining us online or in person, we're so happy that you're here today. Um, it feels like fall, so I guess we have to admit that it's almost here, which means that we have some activities coming up. Um, there are several sign-up sheets in the social hall. The first one is this week is the first Wednesday of the month, and we will be grilling out. Well, I won't be, but someone will be grilling. Are you grilling? Okay, so Pastor Ben is grilling, and we're having um, hamburgers and hot dogs. If you have not signed up, please do so today, because we need to know how much food to buy. We need to know, you know, how many hamburgers and hot dogs to have for everybody. Um, the next thing is there's a leadership dinner Tuesday this week at 6.30. If you plan on attending and have not let someone on that team know, please let us know that too. And then it's time for trunk or treat. It's October, which means we get to celebrate um, with trunk or treat. And there's a sign up for cars, for volunteers, to bring in candy and all those good things. Um, and since it's the beginning of the month, I wanted to share a care portal update. And I could stand up here and tell you guys about numbers, but those numbers don't mean as much as me telling you a little bit about the why. The reason we get to do this each and every day. Um, it's all about the children. It's about the kids that are in their homes with their bio families. Maybe it's a kinship placement. There's over 27 families that are kinship placed right now. And, or it's about the foster care. So I wanna tell you about a recent request that we got. And it was for a grandma who had taken in her two grandkids. And um, she's a single lady and um, was not prepared for this situation. This was not something that she anticipated. And they needed quite a few things. And I'd sent this request out to the team so they had got to see it. They needed um, bunk beds. That includes mattresses, pillows, sheets, all of those things. They needed some toys. They needed some clothing. Um, and just the chance to like, you know, have those things that you need to make a home a home. And so um, our, t our church, you guys rallied. Like I sent this out and there were eight different families that came together to make this request happen. So I wanna say thank you for that. But um, on a Monday morning, um, three of us headed over with the bunk beds and all the things that we needed to do. And we didn't get to meet the kids because they were off at school and didn't get to meet grandma even because she was at work, but her roommate was there. And we built those beds and we got them all put together and left the items. And later that day I got this email and it says, they're so surprised and happy that they have their own bed, as was I. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for everything. That's one of the whys. That's why we do it. Because this family, these two little kids, now have a bed. But you know what? God wasn't done with that story yet. And I still don't think he's done with it. As we know, he works in mysterious ways. Later that night, I got a message from the social worker saying thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for your church, for everything they do. And then because, you know, we needed one more time to reach into this family, I had another member of our congregation somebody who um, works in an outside entity, and they sent this one to me. This was the very next day I got this email while, or text message while I was in the meeting. It says, hey, I just left the new family on my caseload, and the minute I walked in, the little guy wanted to show me his new bed. Grandma said thank you again. God keeps wrapping our church around this family. As I said, I don't know where the story ends, but at least for a little while, they know that someone cares greatly about them, cares enough to want to help in just a small way to provide a bed and some clothing and some toys for this child. So thank you for being a congregation that cares. Thank you for wanting to step in on that. And if you want more information, if you wanna know how you can help deliver those items and build the beds, um, talk to me if you wanna know how you can see the request or if you just wanna pray for these families. Prayer is an amazing thing, and we know that God answers our prayers and he hears them. So if you want to do any of those things, see me or check out our website. You can see all these things on the website. But I just want to thank you guys. You guys are awesome. And we need to remember that whatever we did for the least of these, you did for me. Jesus tells us that. 
So thank you. Let's stand up. One, two, three. Thank you for being unchanging and ever loving and always present. You are in our lives and you are in us, so thank you for that. Thank you for everything that you have done and everything that you will do. And it is in your most precious name that we pray. Amen. Watching the time just ticking. Clock runs around, days in and out. Can't really call it living. Somewhere I let light go down. But here's where my new story starts. Take my life and let it be. Set on fire for all to see. Bring me down, build me up again. Don't leave me the way I've been. Take my heart into your hand. Come and finish what you began. Till I see your. 
shine, shine, like heaven on earth, do 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 like heaven on earth, do 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 I want to wait, I want to see all of the ways you're moving. Show me the need, cause I want to be a part of what you're doing. In my heart, let kingdom come. Not my will, let yours be done. Take my life and let it be. Set on fire for all to see. Break me down, build me up again. Don't leave me the way I've been. Take my heart into your hands. Come and finish what you began. Till I see your kingdom first. Help me rest when I should rest. Help me give what I should give. All of me, nothing less. Help me speak with grace and truth. Help me fight for those who can. Help me love the way you love. Never hold me nothing back. Take my life and let it be. Set on fire for all to see. Break me down, build me up again. Don't leave me the way I've been. Take my heart into your hands. Come and finish what you began Till I see your kingdom first Till I shine, shine Like heaven on earth do 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 Like heaven on earth do 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 Like heaven on earth Revelations 3, 2, and 3. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, hold it fast, and repent. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat.
Sorry there, Josh. No one notices, like, we, we mess them up all the time back there. But oh, one of the things we were talking about is that the Lord formed the first human and breathed life into him. And it was a reminder that really, apart from God as the source of our own life and breath, we're really just dirt as humans. And it's a, it's a beautiful image because it's humbling, but it's also reminds us that God loves us so much that he gave us, gives us his very own life in us. And so this morning, as we come into a time of prayer, what I want you to do is just shut your eyes for a second and take a deep breath and be reminded that that was a gift from God this morning, that we do truly need him for every breath and every moment. So what I'd like to do is just take a moment to quietly settle ourselves and just ask the Lord to bring things to mind that we ought to be thankful for. And then I'll pray, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Will you join me? Father in heaven, I am thankful this morning for the very breath that you give us. Lord, every day from you is a gift to us a gift where we get to partner with you here in creation to do your work. And so, Father, I thank you this morning for saving us through the blood of your Son. Lord, I thank you for gathering us together as saints to worship this morning. Father, I thank you for your presence amongst us through your Spirit. And so, Father, help us to be a people that's just mindful that we are dependent on you for every breath that we take. And help us to be thankful for all the blessings that you've placed in our lives. Lord, it's so easy for the enemy to get us to focus on the things that are hard and difficult, the things that we don't have, uh, the number of obstacles and hurts and pains that are in our life. And Lord, those are realities and they're numerous. But Lord, I think sometimes they take my, my eyes off of all those little graces that you give us each and every day. And so, Father, well us up with thanksgiving for your presence and your life within us. And so, Father, together we pray today as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so speaking of the Lord's spirit and breath within us, we light this candle today to acknowledge his presence here as we come to the table this morning. Now, as we reflect on the table this morning, I don't know if you've noticed, but when I, when I get the chance to be up here, um, I've been trying to give you some R's uh, to think about as we come to the table. And so we've talked about remembering Christ's work and not being a people that's forgetful uh, of his goodness and his presence amongst us. Uh, we, we talked about uh, repenting and this idea of returning to God uh, and just being people who are committed to holiness as we follow him. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, a word reconcile. 
Uh, Jesus, in, during the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, he said this. He said, you've heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders shall be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be danger, uh, in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. I could take you to 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul will speak uh, to those uh, that the church, because people were getting sick and dying because they were treating each other with contempt before coming to the table. And so, in countless other letters, he's going to talk about the unity of the body being a really, really big deal. And in fact, I think there'd be, you'd be hard pressed to find that there's more verses committed to anything in the New Testament uh, than that particular issue. And so this morning, what I want to encourage us to do is to think about the re reconciling work that, one, Christ did between us uh, and him, but also the expectation that he, he expects that from his people with one another. And so today, just to, to take a moment, we're going to spend some time uh, praying, but I would encourage you to think about that. Is there somebody that I have something against or might have something against me, and should I take care of that this morning? Should I spend some time uh, offering forgiveness in my own heart, but even seeking out reconciliation. And so as we come to the table, again, I, I, you know, I don't think the Lord necessarily operates as taking people out in, in body bags anymore, but in the early church, he did that. That was how serious it was of a thing. And so let us reflect on that and consider that this morning. And so I'm going to pray for our time together and uh, encourage you to just let the Lord search your heart and then if you need to go out to the lobby or go across the room, make a phone call, whatever you need to do to set those things right uh, before the table this morning, I would encourage you to do that very thing. Um, and, and think of that word reconcile, because that's the beauty. The Lord didn't want us to just be right with him. He wanted through the blood of Jesus to make a way for us to be right with one another. And so uh, that's the thing I want us to reflect on this morning, because there's little in scripture that's more dangerous or detrimental than harboring unforgiveness and conflict within the body. And so let me pray, and then you can do what you need to do this morning. Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for the reconciling work that Jesus did on that cross, the forgiveness of sins and making a way for us to have a right relationship with our God, the God who created us. And this morning, Lord, I, I want to acknowledge that an expectation of stepping into that reconciling work is to offer it uh, unto others. Jesus made bold statements like, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. And Lord, that's difficult, because people do heinous things. Lord, hurt is a, is a real issue. Father, I know that uh, being in church ministry is a place that I've taken wounds. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you don't permit me to just harbor those things and sit into that, but to stare the gospel in the face and reflect on that and give me an opportunity to extend forgiveness as Jesus did to those who don't even deserve it. Father, because I certainly didn't deserve yours. And this morning, Lord, I pray that you'd do a work that you'd reconcile us not only unto yourself once more, but that you would continue that reconciliation work one to another. That we would be a people that because of what Jesus has done for us would leave this place free of bitterness and unforgiveness. And so do a work this morning as we come to your table this morning. Father, I thank you for the God that you are, and I thank you for the family and the kingdom that you're building right here on earth in the church. Help us to reflect you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink, do so in remembrance of me.
Church, for when we come together and we eat this bread and drink this cup, we declare the Lord's death until he comes and proclaim the wonderful mystery that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Please come and receive the bread and cup this morning. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my Deeper within, 
I was just telling Ben, it's a whole new view from up here. I am a back pew girl and always will be. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Danielle Brown, and Cindy and Ben have asked me to share just a little bit about how me and my family found Wyatt Park and what has kept us here for five years now. So I grew up in a small Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, very, very small town, maybe 50 people. So we were a community. The kids in the congregation, we did everything together. We went to school together. We hung out together. If we weren't in school at the same school, we were at rival schools, so we still had connection. We went through confirmation. We went to national youth gatherings. We did things, and that was really important to me, to my family, and to me as I grew up. So as I grew up, moved away, I kind of just kept going back to the Lutheran Church. Ended up at a evangelical Lutheran Church and started going there with some kids that I was working with at the time, and one of them was Lutheran, so we were just like, okay, let's just do that. Ended up at that church and stayed at that church. Um, Toby and I started our family, and it was just a fit, so we joined the church, kept going with things, um, got involved a little bit more. Even, I think Atticus started Bible school when he was two because, well, I was jumped right in and joined along and all of those things. So I served as the church secretary and treasurer for a while, served on the council, got more involved with Sunday school, Bible schools, all of those things. I think I've missed one year of Bible school since Atticus was two. So that's 10 years. And sorry, Tanya, I took a year off when we moved here thinking, oh, I can step away from this. It'll be all right. It didn't happen. Um, so when we moved to St. Joe five years ago, after many trips back and forth to finalize our move, we were like, okay, where do we go? What church is here for us? Well, Toby had met Scott attending the Global Leadership Summit, and so it felt right. We start there. Let's see what happens. So we came to church. We were greeted. We were greeted by Anne, and she was very welcoming, and we talked, and we talked about, you can sit anywhere, you can do anything, we're a welcoming church, thank you for coming. We were then greeted later that afternoon by, I think it was Ron Ochter, who dropped off a little welcome gift at our front doorstep. So we were like, okay, we can go back, but we kept coming back, and kept coming back. About six to nine months later, Toby goes, so are we going to visit any other churches? I don't think we need to. <laughs> I think we found home. So this has been the one and only here in St. Joe. It just felt right. We joined the church. We're involved. We have a community here. We have a people who are there for each other and who really wrap their arms around each other. So <clears throat> an engaged children's program, an involved congregation, a welcoming people, a church that's alive. A church with many people from many backgrounds, many ideas, and individual relationships with God. We don't say you have to believe this or you're not welcome here. We don't say that you have to worship this way or you can't come. We have the contemporary service right now. We have the more traditional service coming up really soon. Over the last week, we had a couple, a few um, dinners to talk about the campaign that's coming up. I was fortunate enough to go to two of the three of those. I wanted to share just a little bit of what I heard about why you all, the people who love Wyatt Park, love Wyatt Park Christian Church. Some of the things that I heard were, people are always there for each other. I know if I need something, someone from the church will show up. We get to study the word without an overseeing body that tells us how and what we are to study and how we are to worship. We are not told how we have to interpret the word. We can discuss our thoughts and feelings about what we have about the Bible. We can have discussion. We can have open conversation. I understand this to be this. What do you think? The children are involved and engaged with their parents in worshiping, singing, dancing, and showing their love for Christ. There are lots of opportunities to in be involved in church, many missions to contribute to and participate in, many different Bible studies to be involved in and learn, express ideas, and come together to learn about Christ. So many people who come from different backgrounds to worship, everyone is welcome. 
we are the people of this church, the people who make this church alive, the people who will continue a foundation on which this church of Wyatt Park, the future of Wyatt Park, will be established. Thank you so much for everything that you guys have given to us as our family. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Danielle is the chair. We have we are starting a capital campaign. Uh, we'll have let's put, bring up that slide. You've seen that picture a few times. Uh, this capital campaign. The theme is revival, and we have a steering committee that's been sort of leading us through this capital campaign. And Danielle Brown is the chair of that of that steering committee. But we've got other members, and so let me just ask, if you are on the steering committee for the capital campaign, could you just stand up for just a moment so we can acknowledge you? Steering committee members, I know we, we have, okay, there's some back there. Danielle was back there, awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. And one of the things that the steering committee did was put together, you'll see in your insert, I don't wanna see any of these sitting in the pew, okay? So please do not leave one of these sitting in the pew. Please take this home with you. Uh, you'll see all the way through until we meet next on Sunday, there are just really simple, meaningful Bible verses. And what I love is under the Bible verses, there's a be the spark, be the spark. It's taking the scripture and it's putting action to, uh, to what we're reading. And so please take these home with them, use it as a bookmark in your Bible, and let's pray over the next three weeks specifically as we gear up to uh, conclude our capital campaign here in three weeks. So if you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. If you are using the Pew Bibles, we'll have those numbers on the screen for you. And we're just going to read a, just a really short passage this morning from Hebrews 12, just three verses. But I don't want you to forget the context of Hebrews 12. And so I'm just going to encourage you that when you have some time this week, perhaps read Hebrews 11, the whole chapter of Hebrews 11, um, for some context. But Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 3. The author of Hebrews writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. May these words settle into our hearts this morning. I think one of the most, uh, I, I would say, the inspiring scriptures, the inspiring chapters of the Bible is Hebrews 11, which comes before what we just read. If you are ever in need of sort of a pep talk, you find yourself where you just wish your, your coach from high school, your football, your volleyball, your baseball, your track coach, you know, could be right there and like, come on, get up. You can keep going, right? Hebrews 11 is sort of that coach, right? So if you ever need a little pick-me-up, read through Hebrews 11 and underline the names that you read in Hebrews chapter 11. If you are new to the faith or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, you can read the stories of those individuals in Hebrews 11 and find some inspiration when you're going through difficult times. But I think what's more important than the celebrities that we find in Hebrews 11 are other people that the Hebrews author mentions. And he doesn't mention them by name. In fact, they're called others. Their stories weren't written down in the pages of Scripture for us to read uh, because they didn't really, maybe sometimes they didn't have those miraculous things that happened to them until the very end of their life. And so uh, here from Hebrews 11:39, listen to these words from the author. He says, these, all of these other unnamed peoples, they were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, 
so that only together with us would they be made perfect. In other words, he's saying these other people who weren't mentioned in Scripture, they lived their lives faithfully, living the call of Christ on their lives, and they found their reward at the end of their life when they took their last breath. My friends, we today are disciples because there were disciples yesterday and the day before who lived faithfully to Christ even though there was no glory in it for them. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, we are starting this capital campaign. You're going to hear these words over the next few weeks happening here at Wyatt Park Christian Church. Now, before I go any further, let me, let me just define. Some of you may be wondering, what is a capital campaign? I know there's many of you that have been through a capital campaign here at the church, but this is the first time for some folks. And so I'm just going to use just this definition from Rocket Mortgage, right? Uh, Rocket Mortgage. A capital improvement is a permanent structural alteration or repair to a property that improves it substantially, thereby increasing its overall value. So a capital campaign is usually the, the efforts to raise the funds for capital improvements, right? Um, but a capital campaign isn't just about increasing the value of a property. That is one reason for doing so. But if you own a house or you own some sort of building, you know that there are expenses that come up year after year that you have to put into your property, not just to raise the value, but simply just to live in the buildings, to use the buildings properly. And oftentimes those monies are over and above what you pay for mortgage and what you pay for insurance. Am I correct? Is that okay? All right. So, so a capital campaign seeks to raise sort of those necessary funds that are over and above regular tithes and offerings in order that we would be, us together as, as a family of Christ, would be good stewards uh, of these building and ground. The, the, this building where we're at today, this is our, our home. Where, where we as a family, as a Wyatt Park family, this is our home together. This is our living room right here. We got our kitchen right out that way. We have a friendship area. We have a place where they, we send the kids when we don't want to hear them, right? No, that's our, the, the youth, right? <laughs> yeah, this, this is our home together. This is our place together, and we love this place, and we've been taking care of it. And so uh, in, in September of this past year, we ended uh, the last four-year capital campaign that raised over eight hundred thousand dollars over eight hundred thousand dollars that went some of that went towards a 1.3 million dollar loan that was used to update and to improve and to restructure the most used and necessary parts of this building and many of you know where those things are we're sitting in one of the rooms right now next week we're going to talk about the building the structure and we're going to have a video that Pastor Aaron put together that's going to remind you or maybe let you know for the first time what the $1.3 million went to, how it was spent, and how it is aiding us in our ministry today. Um, and so thank you for your generosity. And when I say generosity, I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. Some people might say, well, I was only able to give this much, right? You're thinking of somebody or other people who gave to the capital campaign who you're like, surely they gave more than I was able to give. My friends, that is not the point of a capital campaign because I'm reminded of Jesus' parable in Mark chapter 12. Perhaps you know the parable as the widow's offering or the widow's might. That's a parable where Jesus sets the, the stage and it's sort of this scene at the temple treasury where people are going and dropping their, their, their gifts, their tithes, their offerings off that are going to go to support the temple's ministry. And the parable says that there were some rich people that came and gave great amounts. But it doesn't center the, the activity. The, the parable doesn't center on the rich people. It centers on this widow. who She didn't have a lot to give. But in that parable in Mark chapter 12, this is what Jesus says. He says, calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. And so generosity is not a matter of how much, it's a matter of your heart towards God. And so every person, every one matters, every gift matters, and every person and every gift makes a difference because this is an all-together thing. This is a family thing. Now, you've seen images on the screens today of, 
a lit match with a whole line of matches that are yet to be lit. And our steering committee for the capital campaign and our communications team, Michelle Vandevoort and Chris, uh, they decided, hey, we think this idea of revival is a great theme for this capital campaign. And so a part of this theme of revival is sort of a, you know, if you've been given to the last four-year capital campaign, we'd love for you to revive your commitment and continue to help us in this next capital campaign. Um, but there is another sense in which we can view this revival theme. There is an opportunity for new people, because surely over the last four years, which we've been through a global pandemic and a bunch of other things since then, in the last four years, we have new people who have come here. And so it's an opportunity for new people to sort of light your match and join us in this next capital campaign. This is an opportunity for us here to sort of continue to take care of this home that is at 2623 Mitchell Avenue. To say that a, that a capital campaign is just about a building, though, and to say that it's just about paying down the, the debt from the, the last loan would be false because the church is not a building. Can you get an amen? The church is not a building. The church is people. How many times have you heard that said? You probably, if you received a penny for every time a pastor told you that the church is not a building, it's people, you could probably give that to the capital campaign and we can pay down our loan, right? Is that, <laughs> that be accurate to say? I had a pastor growing up who told me that he could jump higher than the church building. Pastor told me, he said, I can jump higher than the church building. Now, I thought it was an outrageous claim, and I accused him of lying, and I said, you shouldn't lie, you're a pastor. I mean, you shouldn't lie if you're anybody, but... So I called his bluff on it, and he said that he could jump higher than the church building because the church building can't jump. True. Yeah. He could jump higher. I, so I can jump higher than this church building. The church is people and you may get tired of hearing that but we can't say it enough because today and this week as i've been putting this message together i am mindful of the people all around the globe who are meeting today on the lord's day the first day of the week and because of where they live the country the government that is putting pressure on them perhaps it's dangerous to worship christ out in the open they don't have an established building they may be going from house to house, from abandoned building to abandoned building, worshiping outdoors, worshiping in caves. They don't have what we have. They don't have the wonderful instruments and musicians that we have, the, the pews, the, the chairs, the sound system, the air conditioner, the heat, any of this stuff, but yet they continue to meet because they have one another and they have the Holy Spirit. They know, these Christians around the globe, they know firsthand that the church is first and foremost people together and so the question is for us here in america in the western world has the church become primarily a building for us do we view the church building as the greatest tool of ministry it is an incredible tool my friends i will stand up here and say that this church building is an incredible tool it's a place where we get to gather but it is not the most important tool for us as the church it is nice to fill the pews week after week, Sunday after Sunday, to gather in this place, but the real work of ministry happens when people leave this building on a Sunday morning because you are the mobile command center of the church. You are working remotely when you leave this place today. You are a remote uh, extension of Wyatt Park Christian Church. We, all of us, are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And so everywhere that we set our feet becomes an outpost of that kingdom that we serve. And it's a kingdom where we, we live and we model the ethics of heaven in all of our relationships. When we leave this place, the relationships that you're going to go to, you are a representative of the kingdom of heaven. And so I would say this, that the best evangelism strategy for us or for any church is to dismiss the worship service when it comes time, right? You're ready, you're, you're excited for lunch or brunch or whatever you're gonna have, to dismiss our worship service, to turn off the lights, to lock the doors, and to go each one of us into the places where we are going to go. 
where God would have us to go. That is the best evangelism strategy, sending 150 Jesuses out into this world. One of my all-time favorite songs is a song called Closing Time uh, by a group called Semisonic, and it's a song that's about birth and new life. Now, when you listen to the song, you think it's about the closing of a bar, like a last call for alcohol situation. It's not that. It really isn't, I promise. One of the best lines of this song that's about birth and new life says this, time for you to go out to the places that you will be from. It's time for you to go out to the places where you will be from. That sounds kind of like a Dr. Seuss book, like you're graduating today from some school. My friends, there is a time, there is absolutely a time for gathered worship, and that's what we're here for today. And I hope that no one thinks I'm saying that's not important, because that's not what I'm saying. And if you tell me that's what I said today, I'm going to deny it. I'm going to say, no, I told you, gathered worship is important. And next week, we're going to talk about the gift that this building is to us as a church. But the exit from this place every Sunday morning is prime time for the church when we leave this that's why on the sign out there it says when you leave this place you go out into the mission field this is where the rubber meets the road for us when we leave the church week after week it's where we live out the faith that we profess and teach in this place when we go out to the places that we will be from i love how the great commission in, in matthew 28 Oftentimes you, you hear this idea of go and make disciples of all nations, but the actual the, the verb, the correct verb usage of that verse is as you are going. As you are going, make disciples of all nations. It's not this sort of cart, compartmentalized sort of thing where we have special times of now I'm going to make disciples and now I'm going to go home and eat dinner or now I'm going to go make disciples and now I'm going to go to the winery down the road, right? That's not what this idea of the Great Commission was all about. It's this idea of where Jesus envisions this church who is engaged in all of their relationships in all of their goings, that they're making disciples because Jesus knew that we're going to make disciples of some kind, right? The, the question is not, are we going to make disciples? Because we are going to make disciples, each and every one of us. The question is, what kind of disciples are we making? Are we making disciples of a world that looks more like us and our attitudes and thoughts and behaviors? Or are we making disciples that look more and more like Jesus? What kind of good news are we sharing with the world around us? If people were to follow our example when we leave the church building today, would they be more Christ-like for it? If people were to follow me and my life today and imitate me, would they be more Christ-like for imitating me today? I can't say 100% yes. And so I'm thinking about Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He says to the church in Corinth, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I wonder if we would be so bold to believe that we could say that to the world, to imitate us as we imitate Christ. I attended a church when I was a teenager. It was a church that had Sunday morning and Sunday night services. You remember Sunday night services? Where the preacher, yeah, he had a whole different sermon. So you couldn't like, I mean, if you came on Sunday morning and that Sunday night, you weren't going to get the same message. My friends, I'm glad we don't have Sunday night ser services here. We had Wednesday night worship. We had Friday and Saturday night revival services. And we had prayer meetings. So, I mean, you, you think about all the days that we were either at work or we were at church. It was the same people who met week after week praying for revival, praying for revival, praying for revival. We were lit matches spending most of our time together, basking in our collective light instead of shutting off the lights in the building, closing the doors, and then each one of us going out and being an open door of the church to people in the world. So that congregation that I'm talking about, where they, they, they planted, they were a lot, it was a church that lasted for three years with lot, lots of passion and excitement, but within three years they flamed out. We, as a, as a body, we flamed out. You might say we burned each other up because the church's focus was internal and we kept the light all to ourselves. Our faith was more of a, a come and see kind of model instead of a go and show. 
or you remember show and tell from, from school as, ki as kids where you would take something from home and you take it and you show it to your classmates. The faith for us, the best evangelism strategy is not a come and see what's going on in here, but it's a go and show. It's a go and sell. My friends, the church is people. There's another little penny for you. The church is people, a people who are called out not to live perfect lives, but to live different lives that look like Christ. And so, church is people, and let me just and it remind us today that, you know, we are in this day and age, but we are a part of a church that has existed for 100 and 34, like local church, 134 years, right? We belong to a longer lineage of, of a church going back thousands of years, but here at Wyatt Park Christian Church, 134 years, Christians have met in this sort of general location. The Hebrew writer that uh, we listened to this morning, he encourages us to all of us run the faith with endurance because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And that Hebrew writer sort of listed out those names of those, those people who did amazing things for God in their time. And so when we get discouraged, because we will get discouraged, when we get discouraged, we are meant to recall the lives of these saints of the past who are just like you and I. Just like, they had no superhuman powers. Their humanity was the same as ours. They were imperfect, just like us. They didn't get things right all the time, just like us. But what they did do is they looked beyond sort of the, what things looked like on the outside, and they had eyes of faith. And so is it okay for me to remind you today that we are a people of faith? Sometimes, you know, it, there comes a time for making sense of things and having everything in order and having the steps rightly ordered. But can I remind you today that we are first and foremost a people of faith? That when we lose sight of the next step, that it's okay. And that's actually kind of normal for us as people of faith. The course isn't always marked clearly with signs and bright lights. And sometimes we are called to take a step when we can't see what's coming up next. Sometimes we are called to trust in God's care and love even when we don't experience a miracle or our prayers aren't answered in the way and the time that we think they ought to. And so like those, those others in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 who weren't named, we remember that our ultimate and our final reward doesn't come on this side of eternity even though we would like to see the, the fruits of our labors and everything that we do. And so that great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews, they cheer us on. They remind us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the pioneer. He's the beginning, and he's the author. He's the perfecter of our faith. And so when we can't see the next step and don't always know exactly what it is we ought to do, we keep our eyes on Jesus. The people who established this church, Wyatt Park Christian Church, in 1888... And those who lived out their discipleship here in this community of faith over the last 134 years, they cheer us on as now we run our race. It is now our time to leave our mark on this world in this place. My friends, we have our own hall of faith here at this church, in this place. Saints of the past who ran their race, if you haven't had a chance to read, Pastor Scott, my predecessor, he wrote this book called Beyond the Window. If you are a member of the church and you haven't received one of these books, or if even if you're not a member, but you, you're a part of this church and you want to receive one of these books, find myself, Pastor Cindy, Pastor Aaron. Let, me, let, let us get you one of these books, because in this book, Pastor Scott writes down a few of the names just a few of the names of people who served here. But one of the things that Pastor Scott says is that there are, like, it would be impossible for him to write the name of every saint of the past who worshiped here at Wyatt Park Christian Church. It would be impossible. And that hall of faith isn't the names of a bunch of ministers wearing a nice jacket and a tie, right? The hall of faith is the, the congregation members. It's, it's you who have served in various ministries, unpaid and without thanks, oftentimes, using your gifts and not always seeing the fruits of that work that you put in. Let me sort of wrap it up with, with this. There's a, 
old Greek proverb that I've run into, and I've shared these at our capital campaign informational meetings, but the Greek proverb says this, society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. Society grows great when old men, and we'll include old women in there, and we'll include young men and young women, when we plant trees whose shade we know that we will never sit in, where we put in the work today, and we know there's a good chance that it's probably not going to grow up to fruition in our lifetime. Society becomes great when people say, my life, I'm going to use my life, to do things so that others tomorrow will benefit. We can apply this to the kingdom of God. It makes me think of the parable in Matthew 13 where Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and he says it's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of seeds, yet when it grows, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches kingdom of God is like small seed that you and I are called to plant these kingdom seeds tiny seeds of faith that are not guaranteed to grow up in our lifetime to mature into these these fully grown trees that are useful for birds to come and sit in and for people to find shade under Perhaps it was a seed of welcome when someone came into this building for the first time, or a seed of a much-needed hug at the right time, or a smile when you walked into this building. One of the speakers at the Global Leadership Summit that we went to uh, back in August said that every human asks these two questions, these two fundamental questions, am I seen and do I matter? Every human asks those questions. Am I seen? Do you see me today? And do I matter to you? And so as we're talking about the people of the church, my question is, who was that person or who are those persons who planted a seed of belonging in your life here at this church? Who were, who, who's the person of those persons who planted that seed of belonging? Who were the ones who saw you walk into this place, into this church, and said, come and sit next to me? Right? Instead of saying, you can't sit here, right? this is my pew, they said, you, come and sit next to me. Have you gotten a donut and coffee yet from the social hall? Come and let's go have a donut and some coffee. Can you see the face of the person who enfleshed the love of Christ to you in this place? Who is that person? I would, I would probably bet that there's some of those people are no longer living today, but you're here because of them. Some of those people may not be here today. Maybe they moved away. Maybe that person is sitting in this room today. That person who was that seed that planted into your heart. Who was that person? And now I'm going to invite you to think about you being that one person. That because you worshipped at Wyatt Park Christian Church today, that 50 years from now there's going to be a group of people who are going to wonder and they're going to think about your face. They're going to think about your name because you faithfully served Christ in this day and in this age. And so my question is, as I close up, is what will we do with our time here at Wyatt Park Christian Church? What will we do with our time? What will we do with the seeds that God has given to us to plant into the lives of others? Church. Let's plant some shade trees together. Let's plant some shade trees together. Let's be disciples today so that there will be disciples tomorrow. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that is a seed and has been growing up in our lives. We thank you for the people who have been Wyatt Park Christian Church. Those that welcomed us, who brought us in, who were a friendly face, who have taught us the faith, who have walked beside us, who have prayed for us through difficult times. We thank, we thank you for the, the current community that is here, that surrounds us in this place today. And we ask, Lord, that as we embark on our own mission of changing this world, 
as we join together in this capital campaign of not just paying down debt, but renewing ourselves to the mission and the ministry of this church. God, we ask that you would be honored and glorified, that your light would shine so bright in our lives, all for your glory, all so that your kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. We give you thanks and praise, and it's in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. I would like to invite you, one of the ways to respond to the capital campaign, of course, this is the first of three weeks of talking about this. If you would like more information, first and foremost, if you weren't able to attend an informational meeting over the last week, uh, one, there is a leadership dinner this Tuesday at 6 p.m., 6.30, dinner, uh, leadership dinner this Tuesday at 6.30. If you would like to go and you have not talked to Pastor Cindy, uh, please do that today. Like after service, send her an email um, at the very latest, like today. So anyways, talk to Cindy, leadership dinner. If you would like information, if you did not receive a packet in the mail, we've been mailing some of those out. If you would like information about how you can be involved in this capital campaign, talk to Pastor Cindy, myself, Pastor Aaron, Tanya. Um, we'll make sure that we get a packet to you. Uh, beyond that, if you like, would like prayer, if you need prayer for anything today, if you have not committed your life to following Jesus and you'd like to do that today, uh, let me invite you to come forward during this last song. So let us stand up and sing together this closing song.
suitable sacrifice that we might go out into our world shining bright with the light of Jesus Christ. May you go in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. 